So obviously, we can't really get a room full of people together and talk about coffee without talking about E U D R. Uh, I don't know. It sounds like a seventies disco song, doesn't it? <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll crack that one out in the pub a bit later. Um, but yeah, so I'm incredibly happy to have Mark with us. Uh, for those of you that have seen in Veritas, are our chosen partner going forward with managing this, and this will be a very insightful talk, but to bring us up to date with where everything is and what's going on, I will hand you over to Mark. Mark, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to stand between you and the pub, as always, <laughs> um, and especially with the topic of EU legislation, which I'm sure you're all desperate to, uh, to discuss in more detail. So, um, without further ado, so I'm Mark Furness. Um, I'm the Director of Partnerships at Inveritas. Um, you may not uh, have heard of Inveritas. Some of you may, have, some of you may not have. Um, but we are a, um, a sustainability uh, assurance uh, uh, scheme. We're an NGO, uh, we're a US-based NGO, uh, and we've been in existence since about 2017. Uh, my background is in the coffee trade, um, so I was with Volcafe for 22 years um, in various roles. So I was in East Africa, West Africa, Asia a couple of times, and I was in uh, Switzerland, which is the head office for, for Volcafe uh, for seven years. And that was when I first came across the topic of sustainability in coffee. Um, I think I was late to a meeting in 2006 and got given the job of Director of Sustainability for Volcafe, which was deeply unpopular at the time. Um, and traders really saw sustainability as a threat and had yet to recognise the, the opportunity it could present. Um, really at that time, it was a, a, what was happening was um, a, a, a build-up of certification, so a reaction to the period of low prices in the early 2000s and the response to that by the industry, by trade, was certification. So you saw a huge uh, rise in the in rainforest and fair trade and 4C at the time. I sat on the board of directors of 4C for seven years. Time will never get back. And, um, and that really sort of was the, 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 the picture. Um, there's a couple of problems for the trade with certification. Uh, and I tell you this, just a little bit of background to Inveritas. Um, it's an awkward position for the traders to be in because on one side you know that it's an imperfect supply chain, it's an imperfect world. Um, coffee's being sourced from you know, exotic locations with all sorts of different issues. And on the other side you've got a shiny corporate that uh, demands no child labour. And those two things are difficult to square. Um, and what we saw more and more was you know, activist film crews were very easily finding you know, cases of child labour on farms in Honduras or, or Indonesia. But auditors didn't. Um, and, and there was something sort of not quite right with the, with the, with the, that we could see with the certification system, which works very well on organised farmers, but wasn't working quite so well when we stretched it to cover more or less organised supply chains. Um, and so um, I asked to be taken off the role of sustainability director in about 2013 and given an honest job and sent back to making money out of trading coffee. Uh, and I went back to Singapore and, uh, and was director of Asia for Volcafe for another five years. Um, until uh, 2018, when I was asked by the founders of Inveritas to join an NGO startup uh, focused on sustainability, in which case I said, absolutely not, it's all nonsense and I'm not interested. And then they explained a little bit about what Inveritas was, and uh, it intrigued me. Um, it intrigued me because it was addressing the issues that I had come to understand were the truth um, in the supply chain. So things like uh, the reach of certification. Uh, we were finding that Farmers along the main road or conveniently situated to the trading centres, they would get double, triple, quadruple certified rainforest, cafe practices, you name it. But the farmers, you know, the wrong side of the crocodile infested river behind the craggy mountain, they weren't getting visited at all. And that was probably 90% of the farmers in the country. So you had a real uh, inequality between farmers who were receiving support and good agricultural practices and, and you know, improving their sustainability situation and most farmers in the country that weren't getting those, th those issues. Um, things like the stability of the supply chain um, was always a little bit of a problem for me um, in that you know, on a Tuesday afternoon if you're a Vietnamese farmer and you've got coffee to sell you're likely to sell to whoever comes past the gate with money and not the guy that came around four months ago with a clipboard. That's just the way supply chains tend to work in, in less organised uh, origins. And then a bunch of stuff around the methodological issues of, of certification and square root sampling technology um, the timings of the audit, you know, in the harvest, out of harvest, um, the advance notice given for audits, audits, all these things sort of led up to the conclusion that, that, that it wasn't really uh, f uh, fit for those unorganized supply chains. 
Um, so invariant task was conceived to sort of address some of those issues, and I won't go too far into that, um, just to say that one thing we didn't change was a code of conduct. So there is still, we do assess a code of conduct. Um, it is pretty much what you'd see in Rainforest or Fairtrade or, or, or 4C or, 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 or any of the other codes of conduct, um, in that it's the consensus of civil society opinion on, on what constitutes sustainability. So what is child labour? What is that underpinned by? The ILO conventions, the UN treaties, all of that thinking has been done, and we didn't think that was our job to, to reinvent that particular wheel. Um, what you'll notice there is that deforestation does appear. Um, it, well, there was a consensus of civil society opinion on what constitutes deforestation. Um, it was, in, in essence, in the last 15 or 20 years, has there been degradation or cutting down of protected areas? And if there has been forest removed, has it been done legally or Ill illegally? That was pretty much what was in most of the codes of conduct you know, up to a couple of years ago. What we really changed was the way we assess that code of conduct. So if you don't have a stable supply chain, um, if you don't know where your coffee comes from, how do you assess the conditions under which coffee is being produced? So we developed a, an AI algorithm that takes a satellite scan of the country and identify what looks like coffee producing households, uh, so rural households next to a coffee field. Um, and we then take a sample of that um, and we go visit that farmer um, and we knock on the door and the first question we ask unannounced is are you a coffee farmer um, and if the farmer says yes the machine learning algorithm learns and if the farmer says no the machine learning algorithm learns we'll do that 99,500 times this year across 27 countries in the coffee world to gather data on the conditions under which coffee is being produced Totally anonymized, that there's no consequence for that farmer to, to answer our, our, our survey. He doesn't have to have to answer the survey. Um, we have about a 3 to 4% non-response rate. We try and understand why that happens as well. Um, but it, what it allows us to do is to then demonstrate the risk of, the risk of child labor, the risk of uh, banned pesticide use, the risk of poor soil, poor soil conservation uh, practices, whatever in that, in that, that code, um, the things we measure. We also measure agronomic and demographic uh, criteria so that we can start to correlate that with, you know, is it typically older farmers with a larger plot who are employing children? You know, th that sort of correlation you can then start to uh, establish. Um, we roll that out across 27 countries now. We go every year uh, in harvest to each of these countries and we take a, a sample large enough that it is statistically significant at around about the 10,000 farmer level. So that when roasters then uh, say where their coffee came from, we can start to zoom into different parts of the country and say, well, if all you know it came from Guatemala, we have an answer for the conditions under which coffee is being produced in Guatemala. If you know it came from Huehuatenango, we can zoom in on Huehuatenango. And if it came from those three communities in Huehuatenango, we can zoom in there. Um, it's been relatively successful. Um, so this is the traded volume of, uh, of certified and, ver and verified coffee under voluntary sustainability schemes over the past uh, five, ten years. Um, and we are currently the largest scheme in, in coffee. Um, and we've come pretty much from nowhere, um, but we've, been, we've built a model which is relatively attractive to larger companies and smaller countries. And those are some of our, our clients. Um, so you recognize some of the, the you know, big, ugly industry. Um, JD Peets, Thibaut, uh, largest roaster in Germany. Um, Smucker, the owner of the Folgers brand, um, and then some of the, the well-known uh, medium, medium-sized roasters, but also the direct traders, so the, the, especially the US specialty sector. They love it because it answers a lot of the questions about is direct trade actually achieving anything? Because we can go into their supply chains, run the same survey, measure things like barn gate price, and see whether the, the premium they're paying is reaching the farmer. Um, or do those farmers have better conditions? Do they use less child labor? Do they use you know, less, less pesticide? Whatever it is that the, the premium is being paid for, is it actually happening? Is the needle moving? We can compare that to the counterfactual of all the farmers in the same region who are not in their, their supply chain because that's the data we're collecting every day. So having said all that, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we noticed a new uh, legislation being gazetted uh, in the EU on deforestation. And, what we anticipated being able to do was to repackage the deforestation data we already had in, on file, put a little bow on top, hand it over as a risk assessment to roasters. That would be their due diligence. Um, and they'd then understand where the higher risk or lower risk of deforestation was. 
Unfortunately, that's not how it worked out. Um, so the definition that the EU has for deforestation is fundamentally different from the definition that civil society had been working with up to that point. Um, so any half hectare of forest, and forest is defined as uh, half a hectare with more than five metre canopy height, 10% canopy cover, I'm sure you've all heard these uh, definitions by now. Any area of forest that is deforested cannot be planted with one of seven commodities and that commodity cannot then be, well, it ca can be planted, but that commodity cannot be imported to the EU once it is mature. So a very specific definition of what deforestation is in the terms of the EUDR, in terms of the legislation. So last year this was next year's problem. This year it's very much this year's problem, and there's a, a crescendo of, of interest now in, um, in what's going on. We've been working on this for a couple of years now, um, and I'll show you what we've been doing on it. Just to give you a sense of the, sort of the, 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 the preparedness of, of major industry, um, I was talking with the COO of, a, of a, a company called Strauss, which is actually the fifth largest roaster in the world. They do a lot of Eastern European um, brands. Um, they also work in Brazil and, and Israel. Um, and I asked him what it, you know, how was his preparedness, you know, what was it looking like, and he said, we are somewhere between hysteria and panic. <laughs> So you're not alone if that's where you are at the moment. That's, that's a, it's a common reaction even amongst, you know, very, who should be very well prepared organisations. Um, this is the map that the EU probably had in mind when it first included coffee in the list of seven restricted commodities. This is Global Forest Watch. It's done great work over the last 10, 15 years in highlighting where deforestation is, uh, is happening, where forest loss is occurring, where tree loss is con uh, occurring. Um, and the concept's pretty simple. Um, there is a, a, a tree cover layer in green. Where that tree cover goes, where it's removed, then the, uh, the, there's a highlight in pink. That pink is deforestation. And what you can see is there's a lot of intersection between areas that produce coffee, Southeast Asia, in Africa, Latin America, and those pink layers, that deforestation. And so that really... And there was a, a few reports that came out at the same time that was linking coffee to a lot of deforestation in particular. Uh, I think one of them said 9% of global deforestation was being caused by coffee. We found that surprising because we didn't see that in our data that we were collecting in our day job as responsible sourcing uh, ass uh, assessors. So uh, we took it at face value, but what we did then to dig into is a little bit behind Global Forest Watch, what's leading them to that conclusion? So this is what happens when you zoom in on Global Forest Watch. And the EU's idea is pretty simple. Um, you just locate your farms on the map, the ones that, that uh, supply you. Very easy to do. All the farmers have smartphones without crack screens. That'll be easy enough to do. Um, you pass those to your supplier, and that goes up the chain. And eventually, you get a list of farmers who've supplied that coffee that you can give to the EU IT portal traces. And they will be able to check that there's been no deforestation. That's part of your due diligence. There's a couple of things you'll notice about this map. Um, the back layer, the, the wallpaper, is quite granular. And that's, that's half-meter satellite imagery, um, probably from Maxar or Planet. The deforestation layer in pink is more granulated. It's more pixelated. Um, and the reason it's more pixelated is that WRI, World Resources Institute, which is the organization behind Global Forest Watch, they don't have the right to use the half-meter imagery for analysis. They can use it as wallpaper, but if they start to crawl their AI engine over that data, they will get a cease and desist letter um, very quickly, something we found out about 18 months ago. Um, and what they do use is a thing called the, the Hansen data set, which is the Landsat satellite system, and that's a 30 by 30 meter satellite system. It's been around for a long time, um, it's done great work, um, but it is less granular, and I'll give you a sense of just how less granular it is in a second. So three questions you have to answer if you're going to import coffee to the EU or export coffee to the EU. First of all, is, is the land where that coffee is produced, is it, uh, was it forest on the 31st of December 2020? Um, or was it a tree crop? Because it could be pepper or palm oil or cassava and converted to coffee, that would be fine. So if it's existing agricultural use, absolutely fine. It's only if it's EU-defined forest on the 31st of December 2020. So you need to be able to, be able to answer that question. Secondly, if it was forest, has it been subsequently deforested? And if it has been deforested, has your crop been planted on it? 
And if it has, is it at a sufficiently mature to produce crop that could go to the EU? Because if it can't, it's by definition currently compliant. So immature coffee cannot produce coffee that can be formed part of a consignment to the EU. So those are sort of the, 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 the tests you have to, to uh, address. First question, is it forest or is it tree crop? So that is 30 by 30 meter satellite technology. <coughs> In that image, there is a tree crop and there is forest. And I'll give you a moment to tell me which one's which. So what you'll very quickly recognize is that there's not enough information in that image, either visually or algorithmically, to determine what is tree crop and what is forest. So the EU recommends, but it does not require, that you go to 10 meter resolution satellite, satellite technology, so Copernicus Sentinel systems, which are EU satellite systems. So that's the same image at 10 meter technology, and I'll give you another moment to, uh, <laughs> to tell me which one's which. And again, there's not enough visual or, or, or algorithmic information in that, in that to, uh, to determine uh, the, uh, the forest and, and the tree crop. We pretty quickly realized you were going to have to go to the half meter resolution in order to be able to make that distinction. And in each of those 30 meter pixels uh, in Landsat, there's 3,600 of the half meter pixels. So it's, a, it's an exponential increase in data. So what you've got now is enough data to run through an AI model and come to a, to a conclusion on what the, uh, what the crop is. In this case, palm oil on the left and forest on the right. All right, so second question, if you've now determined what is forest and what is tree crop, has it been deforested? So that is um, a coffee plantation in Vietnam, uh, in Dak Long. Um, you can see that on the left, you've got the coffee plantation um, uh, a couple of years ago. It's actually 2021. That was then renovated. Um, what the satellite sees there is something, or what, at 30 or 10 meter resolution, you see something green turn brown. That is then misinterpreted as, defore as deforestation. So you can see the, the Global Forest Watch at that point ping that as a deforestation case. So if you're using Global Forest Watch for your assessment tool to say whether something is deforested or not, that would now be non-compliant coffee and you would have to do further due diligence to establish whether that was true or not. This problem with false positives is widespread, and I'll give you a sense in a moment. Um, so the third question you need to answer, well, if it was forest and it's been deforested, has my crop been planted? Because if, if you planted cabbages, the EU doesn't care. It's only if you planted coffee or cocoa or soy or rubber or uh, palm oil or and, and there's a couple of beef, timber. There we go, all seven. Um, and, is it, and, and that crop is now compliant. Um, so this is the task that um, agri-tech has genuinely been using AI and satellite imagery for for the past 10 years or so. Um, it's detecting things like corn in Iowa. Very carefully delineated crop boundaries, manicured farm boundaries, no canopy cover, a monocrop. Uh, similarly with palm oil, it's quite easy to detect uh, from satellite imagery. It's a monocrop, uh, there's no canopy cover, cover, all those things that could confuse um, a, an AI model. But with coffee and cocoa and rubber and forest in the tropics, this is what the satellite imagery at half meter looks like. And that's if I gave you the half meter. If I gave you the 10 meter, it looks like that. And you can't take anything from the color because the color will change depending on what time of day the satellite goes over, uh, soil moisture levels, time of year, etc., etc. So all sorts of different factors playing in there. But what we realized at this point is if you're going to build a, a, a model that can, that can actually determine which one's which, we were going to need an exceptionally good AI model, which is something luckily we've been working on for the last seven years. And we would need to back that up with ground truthing because a machine learning model can't learn unless you tell it when it, when it got it wrong and when it got it right. So we have a team of around about six to 700 people at the moment checking. So going to GPS points in coffee producing, cocoa producing areas of the world, especially where the model is confused and saying, no, this is cocoa. No, this is coffee intercrop with cashew nuts. No, this is bare land. What are, what are we finding? There's so many use cases that you can, you can think of. And we rebuild those models for every country because Coffee in Indonesia looks coffee, different to coffee in Brazil and looks different to coffee in Ethiopia. So that 
model needs to be rebuilt for every country we analyzed. And the output is something like this. So this is a satellite image of Dak Nong uh, in the Vietnamese highlands. Um, it's probably one of the most intense coffee producing regions in the world. Um, uh, you know, Central highlands of uh, Vietnam, huge robusta production. Um, most deforestation there would have happened in the late 90s when the, when the, uh, 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 the crop in Vietnam was expanding rapidly. Um, when we run that through the model, and the blue is coffee, you can see that the, the fields light up. So at half meter resolution, with good AI models and ground truthing support, you start to get a sense of what's really going on on the, on the ground from satellite imagery. It's the this is the first time this has been done. The red polygons are rubber. There's some rice along the riverbeds there, and there's some forest in the south. Interesting, you can see the a bit of that forest in the south has been hollowed out. There's some rubber plantation gone in there, and actually a couple of coffee fields as well. If that happened before 2020, absolutely fine. That's compliant. If that happened after 2020, that would be um, not elig eligible for export to the EU. So one of the systems that the EU recommends uh, to use, so the JRC, the Joint Research Council of the EU, recommends a tropical moist forest map to determine where the, where the, for the forest layer is. So this same area looked at through the lens of the tropical moist forest map. And remember, green is forest. So what it's doing is seeing something green. And it's assuming that that is forest. Because it, you can't tell at 10 or 30 meter imagery what the hell it is. Um, that gives you a couple of problems. The first problem is you've got to find somewhere to drop your pins now as a diligent EUDR operator. Uh, to say where your coffee came from. And it's going to be pretty awkward if it came from a forest canopy. Um, the second problem is, as these farmers renovate, manage shade trees, cut down boundary trees, um, cut down fruit trees, change crop, you know, from coffee to pepper, pepper to cashew, cashew to, to uh, durian, it's going to start to look like deforestation. And that's what we see already. Uh, this is... Uh, the same area viewed through the last three years of Global Forest Watch, and you can start to see the, the, the salt and pepper of, of, uh, of specks of deforestation there, so the pink being the deforestation, or the false positives. And eventually that whole area will be a false positive. It will all look like it was deforestation when in fact it's just commercial agriculture. So the importance of using good, granular, AI-modeled, ground-truthed data cannot be overestimated. You will pretty much have no chance of establishing whether it is forest or coffee unless you're using that, 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 that system. Um, just to give you an ex example of, of, of the difficulty here. I was in Uganda 10 days ago. Um, I spoke to one of the largest exporters in Uganda. Um, they said they're using uh, satelligence to, to, um, to uh, assess their list. They put a, a 20,000 farmer list in, in Uganda. Um, they'd run it through the system. Now, we know in Uganda, using this system, there is not a single case of non-compliant deforestation. We've worked with the UCDA to remove the handful of cases that were there. We've re remediated it. We've compensated the farmers, and there's been crop use change or reforestation. So we know not a single case of non-compliant deforestation currently exists in Uganda. When they ran the, the 20,000 farmer list through their system, 10,000 were pinged as high risk of deforestation, so it would have to be excluded from the list. So half of that list was, was deemed non-compliant, and they were all false positives. This is what happens when you zoom in a little bit further. So um, this is actually a Google Earth image, um, and the model was predicting an area of deforestation and mature coffee in the red polygon, uh, the red shape file there. You might say, well, it was, it was close, but it was wrong. It, the, uh, there's a triangle of deforestation there and, a, and a, a semicircle in the south. That's where the deforestation is, and it looks like there's some coffee being planted on it. And that's what you'll see today if you go to Google Earth and look at that, at that GPS point. You'll see that image. You won't see the red polygon, but you'll see the, the image with the, the triangle and the, and the semicircle. What you won't see unless you dig in a little bit is that that image is from 2019. And images on Google Earth don't update very often especially in, in rural areas of the tropics where there's not much business model uh, in, in 
making those updates frequent. So it's actually a very old image, five years old. When we flew a drone over this, because every time we find a case of deforestation and conversion to coffee, we ground truth it. We send somebody on the ground to go and establish whether that was actually the case. So what we found when we went there was that. So there is a, a case of deforestation. It has been cleared. Coffee has been planted. And that coffee has now been, uh, is now mature enough to export to the EU. There has been some more deforestation just to the north of the plot um, and to the, and to the uh, west. Uh, and that looks like it's been planted with coffee as well. But it's still immature coffee. So that's next year's problem. And there's been some deforestation to the south. That's still uh, bare land. It's likely it's going to be coffee at some stage. Um, but at the, mo at the moment, it's not. Um, but once we understood this, we understood something else about the regulation. It's actually a tree-level traceability system that you need. Because the coffee from this tree, that's absolutely fine. That can come to the EU. But it needs to be segregated. You need to take that coffee and um, take it to, to the drying patios, dry it separately, take it to the hulling station, hull it separately, take it down to Ho Chi Minh, put it through the dry mills, stop the dry mill, start the non-compliant run, stop the dry mill, take out the compliant coffee, get ready for the non-compliant coffee that's coming from this tree, which is six feet away and probably produced by the same farmer. So that traceability system needs to be in place or you as an operator in the EU or an exporter uh, who has a customer in the EU, you are going to be uh, in line for a fine, is what the EU is saying, essentially. So this sort of traceability requirement here, you, know, you, you cannot underestimate it. It's extremely onerous. What we also realised when we got this data back when we understood how many cases of non-compliant coffee there were, we found that there were very few. And we were not surprised by that. We just couldn't prove it before we had the data. So in most countries, coffee is not expanding as a crop. There are some excep exceptions. So Peru, for instance, would be one exception. Um, Honduras, perhaps, in, in certain parts. But most countries are quite stable in the land use they use for coffee. If there is... Uh, increase in, in, in production. It's normally coming from Brazil, where more coffee is being grown on less land. So yield increases are being affected. And especially in the last four, four years, so since 31st of December 2020. So there's not been a lot of, we wouldn't expect to see a lot of land use change in most countries with a stable, mature crop uh, and conversion from coffee. And that's what we found. Um, in addition, the non-compliant part of that is, the la is about from about f 1st of January 2021 to the mid-2022, we're looking for conversion from that period because anything converted later is next year's problem. That's not going to be mature enough yet to export to the EU. So crops like rubber and cocoa actually have a free ride for another year or two. They, they literally cannot feasibly break the re regulation because it takes four or five years for those crops to get to maturity, six or seven years in the case of rubber. Um, so, uh, so the, um, this traceability system is, you know, is, is very difficult, but we, what we realised then is if we could work with governments to remove the handful of cases of non-compliance, what would be left would be an entire country which is compliant. Um, now, that is not something the EU has been particularly keen on um, because it makes them look like fools. It makes, them look, it makes it clear that coffee should never have been included in the le legislation in the first place. There are countries where we have found zero cases of deforestation, and there's plenty of countries where we found a handful, less than 10. There are some countries, like Peru, where there is a bigger problem, and you will need to have a list-based approach in Peru, in Peru. But what this opens up for us is, is the possibility to... Having mapped the country, having identified all the cases of non-compliance, to then work with the appropriate authorities in the country to, uh, to, to remediate. And that would be compensating farmers uh, for land use change or for reforestation. Um, we've, done, we've got agreements in place with eight countries now. Um, so Papua New Guinea, Uganda, or most of East Africa, Guatemala, Honduras. Um, not every country wants to work with us. Um, now, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll work with country, countries which are willing to work with us. Um, and we've made progress in five countries now such that there is no remaining case of non-compliance. Now, the question we always get on that is, well, does the EU agree? Does the EU approve this approach? To which we have to answer, no. But they don't approve any approach. 
um, because they won't give any guidance to anybody. Um, we've learned a lot about the DG uh, environment F1 department over the past few years. Um, it's a relatively small department. Um, they're the ones tasked with implementing the legislation. They wrote it and implemented uh, the F1 department. Um, and their approach to guidance was, well, we throw, we've thrown a grenade into the middle of seven industries, and there's been a lot of phone calls then. Our response is now going to be to unplug the phone. So that's kind of what happened. I, I, was, in, I was in the Brazilian embassy in, uh, in October. Um, specifically, because I wanted to hear what the EU was t telling Brazil. You know, what's the inside story on, on this legislation? Is there going to be a delay? Is there going to be any changes? And they said, look, we'd love to know, but even our team in Europe can't get a meeting. So they've got a, a Brazilian team in Europe that literally sits there to have meetings with the EU. They could not get a meeting with DG Environment on this topic. Um, so they just they'd shut down. And, and the reason was, I think, whenever they plug the phone in, it's a torrent of abuse. Um, <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> then it's a reasonable response. Um, so, uh, so we're pretty sure actually they will, they will, they're due to, get, to, to put some FAQs out in the next, uh, we've been waiting for them for about three months now for further guidance. So they put some FAQs out in December, which was some guidance, and actually opened up the, the door to this approach with the concept of declaration in excess. So you can actually declare more farmers in the container than actually produce the coffee in the container as long as they're all compliant. Well, now we can prove the whole country's compliant. What we understand is that they're going to say that's not, that's not what we meant. Um, <laughs> we, we do have some uh, allies at the EU on this, so DG, uh, DG Inpart, International Partnerships. Um, they have a responsibility for cocoa and coffee um, because of the smallholder angle. They actually own that responsibility to DG Commerce should look after the trade but actually DG International Partnerships looks after trade with cocoa and coffee um, because, of, because of the, uh, the, the vulnerability of the smallholder communities. Um, they're fighting our corner with DG Environment because we can't get a meeting with DG Environment. We're a US-based NGO. Some of our clients in Europe, you know, they've got a big stake in this. They can't get a, a meeting with DG Environment either. Um, so, but we do understand they're going to res resist this territorial approach at a country level, but they may allow it at a, at a province level. Um, in which case, we'd encourage you to tick as many provinces as you're buying from. Um, so it does, it does open up the possibility. So in cases where you have full traceability, where you know exactly where your coffee's come from, you've got that co-op or farmer list or estate, that's all good. You can put that through the system, and we'll assess it uh, and give you a due diligence statement um, regarding that, sh that consignment. And in cases where you don't know where it came from, but you know it came from Huayuatenango, and Huayuatenango is deforestation free, then we can, we can, what we can do is give you a file with the, the polygons of every piece of coffee in Huayuatenango. Um, we could do that for Vietnam. It's a very big, uh, so we can do it for any country. Um, in Uganda, there are 1.8 million smallholders, around about what, 0 0.14 hectares each. Um, we have over two million polygons of coffee that we can put in a file and hand over as the declaration in excess. Again, they may not accept that. They may need to say it came from Ruwenzori or Mount Elgin or, or Masaka. Um, be that as it is made. The, the, the plots of land that you see here, we can cut to any size. And as long as we find no deforestation, non-compliant deforestation within that piece, we would consider that a declaration in excess. Now, it'll take a brave roaster, I think, to, to take that on and, and, and be in front of the EU with it. So in the meantime, until we get guidance, until we get some clarification here, most people are con concentrating on a list-based approach. Fine. Uh, you know, uh, it's a relatively easy thing to come up with a list. Um, whether the coffee came from that list, I think the EU will struggle to, 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 to establish that one way or another. Um, take from that what you will. Um, but you know, we are aware of some people just taking a, you know, a shotgun and firing it at a map and wherever the pellets fall, that's where my list was. Um, lots of different approaches to, to creating that list. As I say, if you do have co-ops, if you do have the fully traceable supply chain, that's a relatively straightforward uh, uh, scenario. Um, but what we do know is that most of the coffee supply chain is, doesn't look like that. Most of the coffee chip supply chain is unorganized. It's not in a, in a, in a stable supply chain. That is really where the, where the challenges come. That's leaving apart all the, the second part of the legislation, which is the legality 
um, uh, uh, compliance um, because that is a very tricky thing for anybody to comply with. Um, and for that, it, you, you know, supplier attestations, risk assessments really is the only way to approach it. And we've got some support for that as well. So that really is um, the, the main body of what I've got to, to talk about. But I imagine that that is actually a link to our portal, um, which I'll leave up there. Um, so if anybody wants to, we've built a portal that allows you to check um, a list for free. So you can go in, put your farmers in. If you're an exporter and you want to know, if I, before I send this coffee to Europe, is it going to be compliant? You can check your list on this portal. And then if you want to produce due diligence material based on that assessment, then there would be a fee uh, of $11 a ton uh, based on that, so half a cent a pound. Um, we are an NGO. Um, the satellite imagery is not free, so we have to have some sort of mission model around this. Um, so we've built that. Only then pay when you know you've got a compliant consignment that's going to the EU, and then you can have that fight over whether it's the exporter or the importer that, that, that pays that half cent. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Wow. All right, that was 40 minutes. <laughs> know that we are um, the regulations apply to both green coffee and roasted coffee yeah. obviously everyone in here based in the UK is roaster um, so you will need to look into this if you are shipping coffee from the UK to the EU we're working with Inveritas at DR Wakefield to make our UK and EU supply chains EU DR compliant so we will have all the information you need to ship any coffee into the EU from the UK um, so do reach out if you're, you've got any questions about this. One question I did have for Mark. If other platforms are falsely identifying deforestation on smallholder coffee farms yep. up to 50%, yep. is there a danger that this false identification is going to create a lack of compliant coffee in the e EU to meet demand? It depends on the supply of lists. Um, so in theory, yes. In theory, um, you know, you take your 20,000 farmer list, you, you slice it in half, and you take those 10,000 farmers off who are non-compliant. That means you've got less farmers to supply compliant coffee with. Um, and th if that's being replicated across the supply chain, that potentially could, could result in, um, you know, in, in, in shortages. What I think will happen is that traders are quite ingenious in creating the material required to run a list check. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of what traders have been doing for a decade now, is you know, coming up with a way to create traceability. Um, so the risk certainly exists. Um, I think it will relatively quickly be traded away um, over the next six months to a year. But certainly in the short term, what we're seeing is, you know, some traders are saying every shipment from July onwards has to be compliant. Because you know one one missed vessel in Salala on the way to Europe and, and you're done. You know it's December and you're and you're and you're and you're in trouble. So this shortage may hit short term for sure. Um, but you know talk to your trade partners and see see how they're looking to to address it. And I, will, I would also say there's there's a there's a big uh, discrepancy in the way people are approaching how to how to commit this due diligence, how to how to establish the due diligence. Um, and we won't really know who's right and who's wrong until the EU starts finding people, um, which would be you know, sometime in the new year. Uh, they will audit, or they've instructed the competent authorities to audit 3% of, 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 of operators, not consignments. So there's a, there's a common misconception there that it's going to be 3% of consignments will get audited. That's not the case. It's 3% of operators will get audited. And that's likely to be... JD and Chibo and you know, bigger players. You know, somebody sending a, you know, a couple of kilos of roasted coffee on, on, by DHL to the EU, you should probably have your paperwork in place, but honestly, it's unlikely you're going to have you know, a competent authority giving you too much of a hard time about that, it's, 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 at least in the, in, the, in, the, in the short run. And there is some delay in the legislation for small, medium-sized enterprises, which is just d defined as, a, I think it's an entity below a 20 million euro turnover, um, which 
takes a lot of people out of the market. Traders tend to get caught because you have a big turnover, small margins. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Um, I have a little question as well, just on, I mean, I loved your example of the, the tree either side of the line. Is there, like, wh wh where's, where's the, I guess, the burden of proof? You know, if that farmer takes the tree from one side of the line, walks over to the other side of the line and says it's that side of the line, how do you know? How do you know? You, 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 so, <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't barcode a coffee bean. And it, I mean, I, I was at a... A conference last year where they were talking about scientifically they can they can give you that DNA data but the Nagoya protocol yeah. means that they can't get the data they need in order to give you that data has that any of that sort of snafu been recognized within the EU or so it's not I mean that is pretty I mean we've looked at some of that as well you know, to solve the traceability issue you know to, to go back to source look at the uh, there's some uh, near infrared technology you can use to also to determine the molecular makeup of a bean and mm. maybe it's slightly different in this province to that province to get back to farm level is beyond the, the ability of science at the moment um, so I, I, it's not really feasible to scientifically trace a bean to a tree yeah um, or genetically mm -hmm. um, or at least in, a, in any way that's remotely um, commercial um, so really it's going to be up to the to the operator to do the due diligence so the, the burden of proof is very squarely on the operator and then there will be a derived burden by everybody else down the supply chain to, to provide that to the operator. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be up to him to decide what constitutes adequate due diligence. Um, so it could be as, as much as the supplier saying, I definitely came from this group of farmers and they definitely complied with the law. Yeah. Um, and and my, here's my signature and it, by the way, it's in the code of conduct and the supplier code of conduct. That may be enough. Um, and uh, what I don't think will be enough will be to say, and the supplier definitely says he didn't deforest because that is sort of empirically provable. Um, and they have, the, in the legislation, it does, you, do, you are required to use some sort of system to, to establish that. Uh, so I don't think any operator will accept. So for instance, we, we saw, um, I don't know, Costa Rica, the, the Costa Rica put in place a system which is essentially a farmer attestation. That may cut some ice, but I don't think it's enough to, 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 to satisfy the, um, the, the obligation. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I'm going to be careful to word it so I don't get too political. Um, so with this being an EU regulation, something that the EU is implementing, generally with other um, environmental um, legislations that the EU are pushing through, the UK's target tends to be around 15 to 20 years after. <laughs> <laughs> with the possible change of government coming in the next couple of days. Is there any news or, or like insight you can give on when the UK will implement this as like standard? Is it involved in any specific party's manifesto or just generally UK regulation? So there's nothing I'm aware of in a manifesto. Um, there was a, we were due to actually attend the UK parliamentary information ses session with JDE um, in April and that got postponed. Um, and then it got postponed again, and now it's been postponed, who knows when. Um, so the, EU, U, the UK Parliament is certainly considering it. The guidance we had at, the, at, at that time is that they were possibly not going to include coffee in that legislation, which would obviously, I think, would be a sensible um, response. Because there are other crops that are not included in the EU legislation, wheat, for instance, which... It's much more of a call. We, what, we, what we now know is every single piece of deforestation in the world, or in the tropics, we can now look at what land use subsequently came. And I would not want to be exporting soy or beef to the EU from anywhere in Brazil uh, at the moment, put it that way. Um, but exporting coffee and cocoa and, and rubber, they, they shouldn't really be concerned. Um, but I would hope that the UK takes a, a nuanced and sensible approach and, and actually gathers a wider variety of stakeholders with views before they make that decision. Um, and we'd certainly be happy, to, and we are happy to give them the data we have on just how much deforestation each crop is, um, is responsible for. Um, do you envisage a scenario where the EU keep their head in the sand for so long, 
2025 rolls around and people start getting hit with fines and consequently only EUDR compliant coffee can be imported into Europe and there's a lack of it on the market and it starts to affect the futures markets. So, so to be, I mean, only EDR compliant coffee can be imported to Europe full stop. Yeah. Um, I think the market finds a way, honestly. Um, it's going to be painful. It's going to be awkward. Um, and there's going to be some you know, hesitancy to, 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 to get the right approach. But I think the market will find a way to, to, to feel it. In the short run, I think it's similar to, to Tom's question earlier. I think there may be some shortage. You know, as operators are cautious, and you know, the, the law hasn't been tested, there's no precedent, they don't know quite where the, where the lines in the sand are, they're going to be a little bit more cautious. Um, and that may drive, you know, let's go and buy Kozu Pay because we know exactly where it came from in that co-op. Um, rather than buying you know, general Brazilian coffee that might be five cents cheaper, um, but you, you can't be that sure where it came from. You know, you've got a supplier at a station, but let's be, let's be on the safe side. So maybe the, you know, the Kozu Pay premium goes to six or seven cents. But I think it doesn't have to get too wide before traders start filling that, that gap um, and providing more assurance and, and looking to, to seek that margin. You know, it's a very attractive margin for traders. It, it's not, you know, traders, again, have seen this as a threat, but they, they should really see it as an opportunity because they're the ones that, that understand where the coffee's coming from and they can then monetize that now and hopefully pass it on to farmers. Who knows? But, you know, I don't hold that much hope for traders. Today. Anybody else? Yep. Thanks very much for a um, yeah, very clear run through of extremely complicated topic. Um, I just had a question on, um, I think I've understood correctly, um, when you used the example of Uganda and um, uh, there was there were some instances of non-compliant um, coffee farms being identified, yeah. and um, that those farms were then required to um, uh, diversify into other crops. And I just wonder if you could explain a bit more about that process and yeah. how is that something that you've worked with the governments of those countries to enforce? So we work with the local coffee authority, the UCDA, um, and we don't provide the information of where the deforestation event is unless there's a protocol in place of how it will be dealt with. So we want to have assurance that there's no, you know, there's no, uh, no farmer is disadvantaged. Uh, we've got to be a little bit careful because we also don't want to provide an incentive to deforest and plant coffee. So you can't be you know, overcompensating, if you like, um, because that would then provide, create a perverse incentive um, to then have you know, somebody come along and rip it out and, and plant cassava. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a delicate balance, um, but we rely a lot on our local teams and, and our relationships with the, with the authorities there to put those sensible protocols in place. And again, it, it's, it's voluntary. In many cases, these farmers have legally deforested in their country. You know, they don't know about the EU. They couldn't care less about the EUDR. They have, with a permit, chopped down some trees and planted coffee. Nothing wrong. So it's a question, and, and, and we did this, in, we saw this in Papua New Guinea. It was, a, it was a two and a half day trek to the place where the deforestation had happened. We had to go three times, along with the CIC, the local authority in, 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 in PNG, to hold meetings with the, with the, with the village to help them understand the, the consequence of, of this deforestation and to encourage them to take the compensation and replant another crop. Because that small piece of deforestation in Papua New Guinea was stopping 350,000 Papua New Guinean farmers exporting coffee. Uh, and so unless you take that approach where you remove all the non-compliance, and that was you know, the, the, the limited case in Papua New Guinea, um, then, um, then you know, the whole country was blocked. Uh, apart from you know, Carpenter's estate and a few, and a few, um, a few supply chains that might have a, a, a farmer list. Um, and so it, it, it's, you know, we've been very, you know, we've wrestled with that issue. You know, farmers will be inconvenienced. It will be disadvantageous to some farmers. But we, we try wherever we can to make sure those farmers are you know, properly compensated and, you know, and are a voluntary participant in the, in the, in the renovation. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, there we go. 
this, uh, well, first of all, this was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. It was really clear. Uh, this is just actually a personal curiosity, just because I know that they are a very fast growing coffee market and there's a big land mass and I did see it on the list. How's China doing ah, regarding that? <laughs> so uh, China is, a, as always, a special case. Um, <laughs> So one of the problems we have with China is the availability of satellite information. Um, so half meter res resolution is, is very, tightly, uh, <laughs> very tightly controlled in China. Um, we, do work, we do work in China. We have worked with, uh, with a couple of companies in China, in, in Yunnan. Um, we can't assess this yet. We will be able to in about two months' time. Um, because it, it, I mean, it, it was rapidly growing in the 90s to 2000s. It hasn't really rapidly grown since. You know, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, of uh, and, and it was the, you know, there was this assumption it's going to be the next Vietnam, maybe 10 years ago. And it's going to be- There was know, a boom that considered that. Yeah, but it's sort of topped out like a million and a half bags or something. It's not, I mean, it's not a huge producer and it, and it hasn't really done much since. So I don't think we're going to find much in, in Yunnan, maybe a little here and there. Um, but most of the, 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 the land you know, that is suitable for coffee is already growing coffee or tea or, or something. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's a special case. <laughs> okay, well, I think we've reached the end. Mark, thank you very, very much. Very <laughs>